Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Miss Shelly Prosco and Miss Betsy Shandeloff. Miss Prosco is a physiotherapist, yoga therapist, educator, and pioneer of physio yoga with over 23 years of experience integrating yoga into physical therapy. Ms. Betsy Shandeloff has been an occupational therapist for 29 years and is a yoga therapist, air duic wellness counselor, educator, and author. Let's give a warm welcome to Shelly Prosco and Betsy Shandeloff. Okay, thank you, Angela. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome. So I'm Shelly uh, Prosco, and I see Betsy, you unmuted yourself, and video, do you want to just say hi? Hi, everybody. So that's Betsy. Um, so I am going to speak for the first half of our presentation about my journey of integrating yoga into physical therapy, or as we call it here in Canada, physiotherapy, same thing, and the value of that integration. And then Betsy will speak uh, for the second half and we'll include some experiential components. Uh, we'll have some resources for you. And then we'll also take questions um, at the end, of course. So Betsy and I wanted to share this all with you. It's sort of a, a fun photo of us. Um, Betsy and I met several years ago. This is us at the Symposium on Yoga Therapy and Research. It's an annual conference put on by the International Association of Yoga Therapists, and it's where many healthcare practitioners come together. Uh, we learn together, we share ideas, we network, and we support each other on this path of integration. And people come from all around the world. We have clinicians and researchers. And of course, this year it was virtual, but we're hoping to be back in person. And I am coming to you today from this place. So I live in Canada. I was born and raised in Saskatchewan, um, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and went to school there. But this photo you're seeing is where I reside now, which is Sylvan Lake, Alberta, the province west of Saskatchewan. And it's in between Edmonton and Calgary. Some of you may have heard of, of those big Canadian cities right near the Rocky Mountains, the Canadian Rockies. And I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I pay my respect to the First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose diverse histories, languages, and cultures enrich our community. So before I share my story, I would like to take you all through an experiential practice. And maybe this will be nice. Um, you've been maybe looking at the screen all day. So it gives you a sense to just kind of step back. If you do have other things open and phones on or whatever, I do invite you to just kind of put that away if you can. And uh, just take a moment here. This will just be a few minutes. I've planned for well, maybe about four minutes or five minutes or so. And if it's comfortable for you, you can close your eyes and just get comfy. And first, just become aware of your overall sense of energy, whatever that means to you. Perhaps it's high, low, medium, or maybe you're not quite sure that's okay too. So just check in with your energy. And then feel your body in space, perhaps feel your feet, maybe they're on the floor. If you're in a chair, maybe you can feel the chair at the back of your legs. Maybe you feel your sit bones on the chair. Notice if you're seated more on one side of the pelvis or one side of the sit bones than the other. And notice your legs, the right, the left, any physical sensations, temperature. You don't have to change anything, you're just noticing. And then feel your trunk, the front of your trunk, from the abdomen to the chest the sides of the trunk, from the pelvis up to the armpits, and the back of your trunk, 
from the tailbone all the way up to the shoulder blades. And just do your best to stay present. And when your mind wanders, as it loves to, and it probably will, that's okay. Just acknowledge the wandering, acknowledge the thoughts, and then come back to your body, bringing your awareness to your arms. Notice the position that they're in. Notice the space, perhaps, between your arms and your trunk. And notice where your hands are located. Can you feel the backs of your hands, the palms of your hands? And maybe even the space between your fingers. And then notice your throat, the back of the neck. And then the back of the head, the top of the head, the forehead, the muscles around the eyes, your cheeks, your jaw, your lips. Maybe you can even notice the space inside your mouth around the tongue. And then bring your awareness to your nose, the tip of the nose. And the nostrils and where the breath is flowing in and out of the nostrils. Notice if you're breathing more on one side of a nostril than the other. And notice the rate of your breath, the depth of it, the length. If the length of the inhale is different compared to the length of the exhale. And remember, you don't have to change anything. You're just noticing. Notice if there's any pause or a space between the inhale and exhale. Or is it continuous? And again, just noticing without trying to change. And if you notice that something changes every time you notice, that's okay too. Just be aware of that. Notice any qualities of the breath, like is it smooth, soft, or maybe it's a bit rigid or bumpy. And finally, notice how the breath moves your body. So how is your body moving in response to the breath in, to the breath out? Some areas may be more obvious. Some may be a little more subtle. But just being curious, exploring, having fun. Don't take yourself too seriously. There's no right or wrong to this. And then if it feels comfortable for you, you can bring your breath and change it and regulate it so that it's just a little bit longer. So you don't have to take a deep breath. Don't try too hard. Just, just extend it a tiny bit, just enough so that it's comfortable. And if it's not comfortable, then just switch it back to where it was. And just seeing, exploring, what does that feel like? Just to sip the breath. And then exhaling and just letting it last, taking your time, being patient. There's no rush to take the next inhalation. See if you can just allow the next inhalation to, to come. Can you just receive it instead of taking it? Nice smooth breath, like it's gliding or sliding. Soft, almost like it's curvy, yielding, kind. And 
Just let that all go, shake it out, wiggle around. When you're ready, you can open your eyes if you have them closed. And that was just a brief awareness practice, something similar to what we might do with a patient in a session, but also, um, also just for our, ourselves, for our own practice. And at the very end, that was a little bit of regulation. So I did invite you to change it a little bit. So for my story, where I'll start, I just, I'll try to keep it brief here. Um, but often people will ask me, well, what came first, the yoga or the physical therapy? So for me, it was the yoga. So I started practicing yoga in 1990. Um, and it was really just more the physical postures. You know, I just started off very, um, um, not really deep into the philosophy and all the other aspects of yoga. It was really just a physical practice for myself. And then uh, my physical therapy degree, I got into physio school mid nineties. I started teaching yoga practices uh, around 94 or so. So after a few years of practicing, I started teaching in a gym setting. I used to teach aerobics. So that kind of naturally progressed. And then in 1998, it was when I graduated from PT school, and I just automatically started to integrate yoga practices into, into my therapy session. So I first worked in long-term care. So I would do things like different um, poses and postures and things I was learning in yoga that were in scope, within scope of practice, of course, for me as a physio. Um, I would just integrate them into the session. So things like uh, balance class. When I worked with the residents in long-term care, I, yoga really offered some unique and creative different poses and movements. So it was really quite natural. And then I moved on to work in an outpatient orthopedic setting in a sports management or in a sports medicine clinic. And I managed and worked as a clinician at this sports clinic. And even then it was very natural. Uh, again, I was mostly using the physical postures of yoga or the poses. And like I said, it was just really, really, um, uh, yoga just offered just a really creative way for exercise prescription. And I really liked that. And it gave me more treatment options. And of course the patients were loving it. And I got a lot of positive feedback and outcomes were positive. And it just encouraged me to do even more and learn even more about yoga. And then to parallel with that, my own yoga practice was progressing. So I started noticing my own health benefits from my own personal practice. So from when I started in 1990 to now into the 2000s, I just started noticing things, of course, physical, like just moving differently and more ease, more awareness, um, even more joy. Uh, it was helping, seemed to be helping my headaches. Of course, we don't know. There's lots of other factors. I didn't do any randomized control trial or anything, but it seemed that, you know, some of these longstanding issues I had were changing with this really regular yoga lifestyle. So headaches were better. Um, I had this longstanding upper back pain that I, nothing, I tried everything. And as a physio, I tried all kinds of things. And, and so yoga was changing this and my digestion was changing. Uh, my mental health. And again, I'm not painting a picture of perfection I still have um, and always will. That's part of being human, you know, having issues and things. But just overall, I, like I said, seem to be a bit more regulated or more able to be regulated. Um, and my relationships, they like, seem to be, I don't know, just a little more peaceful. Like I learned how to be more aware and communicate more effectively and more self-compassion. That was huge for me. And I'm still learning and I'm still working on it, but that's a big part of yoga is this idea of self-compassion. So within ourselves as clinicians, but also um, for our patients, helping them be self-compassionate. And then over time, I noticed how breathing really changed how I was moving and just changing breath was changing how my patients were moving. It was influencing their pain. So again, I was just playing and exploring. I didn't know anyone else was really doing this. I was kind of making it up as I went along. Awareness practices that I was learning from yoga, again, was changing how I was moving and showing up in the world. And then as I was sharing this and integrating it into my physio sessions, people started moving differently and their pain started changing just from these awareness practices. And lo and behold, now paralleling this time in the 2000s, more and more research is coming out or what's coming out and continues to come out. 
And I just started really integrating or learning more rather about yoga and the philosophy and taking formal trainings and going to that uh, different conferences like that sitar symposium on yoga therapy and research when I talked about at the beginning where Betsy and I met and just learning more. And the word yoga means to yoke, to unite body, mind, breath, spirit. And it's really this practical philosophy that helps us gain more insight into our root causes of suffering and therefore help us prevent future suffering, help us thrive. And so, like I said, I was just kind of doing this integration on my own and then learning more from conferences and trainings and meeting with other healthcare professionals that were trying to do this, you know, all over the world, we're all trying to figure it out. And, uh, and then we all come together and realize, oh, this is a thing and there are people that have been doing it even longer. And um, so that's sort of, that's sort of my path and then started to come into this continuing education role where I teach now other healthcare professionals on this integration. And so as my personal practice really started deepening into more of the yoga philosophy, then that really took this integration to a deeper level. And of course, we don't have time to go through all the you know, to go through yoga and really parse it out. But it's really for me now at this stage, 20, well, I guess 30 years of yoga practice that I see it's, it's really about, um, you know, the philosophy and the foundation and the framework, I believe that makes these practices so powerful. So um, just to kind of go ahead and uh, complement there what I just said in a little bit more formal way. What we have found, I mean, what I have found personally through all these years, but also research now is showing this and more and more clinicians that are doing this integration are sharing this. Uh, we find that integrating yoga into whether it's physiotherapy or any other healthcare profession, especially in the rehab professions, can really fill in a lot of gaps that we might be seeing in our traditional biomedical care. So it really offers this uh, framework and practices that provides a practical and accessible biopsychosocial spiritual approach. So yoga includes many activities that, you know, that can address physiology or psychology, can influence our social health, um, some of the practices I already mentioned, like just the movement, the breathing, the awareness, self-reflection activities, self-inquiry. So I know I'm saying a lot here, but basically yoga has a lot of different practices that can really look at the whole person. And from a social aspect, there's things like class, like group, um, community therapy, yoga, yoga therapy classes. So that can really help access issues like affordability or even just offer social connection, support and a sense of belonging and integration into community. And yoga can also really provide a unique opportunity to include and address spiritual health. So we're integrating spirituality here, whether it's integrating meaning and purpose connection to yourself, to others, and for some, maybe to a higher power. So everybody's different, but some people have a particular faith, and that might be really, really important in one's rehab to integrate their own religi religious beliefs or their traditional spiritual healing practices or rituals, and yoga provides a space for that. Yoga also offers self-management strategies so people can access these independently on their own time. It's free once you learn them, um, just like we practice. People can do that at home and that can improve self-efficacy to give some people control over their rehab and wellness. And we know that's important. And then of course, yoga can offer long-term supportive management. So it's this sustainable lifestyle option that can sustain the improvements that they've gained in rehab and also um, maybe even improve. And I think it's really, you know, kind of interesting just to pause here for a second and remind ourselves in rehab, we have, you know, the three month rehab program or six months or whatever it is. And then we discharge people and we say, okay, now do these at home, you know, sustain this. And that's really challenging for people for a whole host of reasons that we won't get into. Um, but it could be all kinds of different reasons, but yoga can help to offer 
some long-term support, and that can be missing in our current system. Yoga also, the practices and the philosophy are inherently person-centered. So the goals that we co-create with people are, um, they're based on the person's values. And so we may think, well, we should do that anyways. And I think, I think we do and we try. But one thing that I've noticed, you know, learning about yoga and, and the different techniques and, and inquiries and philosophy is that it's really helped me help people explore what matters most in life to them and their core values. Because we think we may know them, but then when we have a, an injury or a condition that's life-changing, sometimes we lose that and, and things just get flipped on its head. So this can be a way to help people um, there's a lot of different techniques, like I said, in philosophy that can help us guide people to help them decide, you know, what do they really value so that the goals can be really meaningful and valued. And then I thought I'd put this bullet point in here, too, because I think yoga is helping to meet the growing demand. So more and more people are seeking yoga for their health concerns across the world, but especially in North America. So not just for wellness, but also for, you know, things like back pain or whatever health concerns they may have. And more and more healthcare professionals are recommending yoga to patients, not just for wellness, but also as an adjunct to their rehab. And who knows why that's happening. Um, it could be just the popularity, but I think a lot of it, I, my theory is that there's two things. One, more and more healthcare professionals are also doing yoga. So like my story, we were noticing the benefits. So we're more likely to say, hey, have you tried this? But the second reason I think this is really important is because there's more and more evidence that's emerging, that's showing yoga is safe and effective for a whole host of different special populations, whether it's musculoskeletal conditions or mental health conditions, cardiorespiratory, neurological, different areas of oncology, rheumatology, chronic pain. I mean, the list goes on and on. There's more and more research and um, some good research, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So um, that could be why it's, it's growing. And then of course, the final point here for how yoga can fill in the gaps, I think it's also because us as clinicians can benefit. So I just wanted to, you know, to share this here that, I mean, I already told you a little bit about my story, but we do see in the literature that healthcare practitioners who practice yoga, not only can that enhance quality of care and outcomes, but it can also help us prevent burnout and address burnout if we do have it. So there, again, we don't know exactly why, there could be lots of different reasons, but I think one reason might be because the philosophy is very empowering. So we are not fixers, we're not the almighty savior. You know, it's not that the, the clinician is up here on the pedestal and the patient's down here and we're doing things to fix the person. It's, it's side by side and Betsy's gonna talk about this much more eloquently. Um, you know, we're side by side co-creating and we're facilitators of the recovery. There's still models for the fix it. I mean, if you have broken a bone or literally torn a tendon, there are surgeons and there are things that happen to fix something, but we're talking about a rehab process where we help progress people towards health creation. Instead of just looking about everything, what's wrong with the person and all the dysfunctions and air quotes where this philosophy is different. It's looking at what's going well, what brings more peace, more ease, more joy. And we work on this process of salutogenesis, which is health creation, instead of a kinesiopathological type model that's looking at all the things going wrong. So it's a different philosophy that can be very empowering for the person as well. And then this idea of therapeutic humility, this was this term was coined by Joan Halifax. She is a, an anthropologist and a meditation teacher at the Upaya Zen Institute in New Mexico. And she also teaches healthcare professionals on um, helping to address burnout and increasing our compassion for in our care without burning out. And this idea of therapeutic humility basically is to do the best we can. Yes, we give everything we have. We, we're, in, we're working in service of the person in front of us also with our own self-compassion and our own boundaries. 
So we're doing the best we can. And then when we're finished the session, we're finished and we let go and we detach from the outcome because it is out of our control. So we're comfortable with this um, uncertainty and we don't have to be that savior. So this is a, is a really important key point and it's a foundation of yoga philosophy, this idea of detaching from the outcome, which makes us more compassionate and more capable to sustain that compassion. And then that's, you know, just yoga philosophy and practices in general are rooted in compassion for self and others. And also compassion emerges from the practice. And we have research that shows this. And I just want to do a shameless plug here on a book chapter I wrote um, in our book um, that we'll talk about in the resources, but compassion and pain care. So it, it goes through all the different research and practices and ways that, that why compassion can be so helpful for the person we work with, but also for us. So just to wrap up before I turn it over to you, Betsy, um, just a reminder that yoga in physical therapy or yoga in, in rehab in general provides both a framework that looks at the whole person within the context of their environment. And it also provides individual practices and techniques. So just remember that it's both a framework and a technique. And there's three orientations that I would say that comes with this. So the first one is that it's for the clinician to share with patients, like you see in the photo here. So you can, you can offer these things in the therapeutic interaction. But the second orientation is then for the patients to practice this either at home on their own or in a group setting. And then finally, the third orientation is for the clinician. So for us to have our own personal practice, which can look you know, different for everybody. So on that note, um, that was quick, um, but I hope you enjoyed that. We'll take questions after. And on that note, I'll pass it over to, to Betsy. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, thank Angela for all of her beautiful help. Uh, and I'm Betsy Shandalov, and I am an integrative occupational therapist. Uh, I'm going to go on and share my slides, and uh, then I'll come back and share my personal story. So I'd like to offer um, this land acknowledgement. Um, I live in the East Bay outside of San Francisco in California. And I'd like to acknowledge that I live and work on the land of the following tribes, the Ohlone, the Bay Miwok, and the Delta Yukats. I play, uh, pay respect to these tribes and the people of California whose diverse histories, language, and cultures enrich our community. This picture is uh, of uh, Mendocino, which is about three and a half hours uh, north of uh, the Bay Area outside of San Francisco. And you can even see the fog rolling in. So a big part of my work and practice has been based in nature and with the focus on that. And I bring that into the work that I do with my clients. And so um, I'd like you just to kind of look at this view. Um, and even in your mind's eye right now, consider yourself there with your feet on the ground and looking out um, at this space and hearing the water move amongst us. Um, and really feel if it were my uh, druthers right now, we would be there um, in a retreat setting uh, doing this work instead of through the computer. But I just want us to keep thinking of, even think about your favorite nature space and continue to think about that and bringing that into work, um, not only as an OT or PT student or anybody in healthcare, but also think about how you would do that with your clients. So let me stop share for a minute and tell you a little bit about myself. I'm sure how to make it bigger. So I'm just gonna go from here. Um, so I, I am an occupational therapist, and I graduated from Boston University in 1992, and I graduated as an undergraduate in occupational therapy. Unfortunately, that is not um, doable anymore, uh, and what I mean by that is I decided I wanted to be an occupational therapist in high school and went to college for OT school. 
And I graduated in four years. And then I did two three-month internships, um, one in mental health and one in physical disabilities. And then I went on to work at Duke Medical Center, which is a fast-paced, acute teaching hospital in Durham, North Carolina. And a reason why I bring it up is it's fast paced. And I don't think that I was aware of what that was gonna be like um, and how many patients I would be seeing at a time. And why it's important is to start to think about our nervous system. So, uh, you know, just think about yourself this morning when you got up, I like to associate it with Tigger, like the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh character. Um, and then um, that's the fast paced. So, you know, think about for yourself when you got up this morning, did you feel like Tigger, you were ready to jump out of bed and you couldn't wait to start the day? Or did you feel like a turtle, which I talked to kids and adults about, like you just wanted to take the covers and put them back on your head and not get up that morning, in the, this morning, or you wanted to delay getting up. How about that? I know you probably were excited about this conference, maybe, or whatever you were doing, but you wanted to delay it. The point being is we've got to uh, tap into our nervous system. What is going on throughout the day? Maybe you had a lot of energy when you started the day, but as the day's gone on, you don't have as much. And that's what's really lovely about the work that Shelly and I are talking about today is that we can use um, movement and breath to change that throughout the day. I wasn't aware that my nervous system was um, really affected by that fast paced teaching hospital. But when I left, I went, my next job was in Atlanta, Georgia, which is at Shepherd Center, which is a spinal cord and brain injury rehab hospital. What's cool about it is the minute I walked in, it feels very different. It was started by a family whose son was injured with a spinal cord injury. And when you walk in, it feels like family. Not only working with the therapist felt like family, but it was quieter. It was healing. And my nervous system instantly changed, I felt, the minute I walked in the door. So I was at Shepherd Center um, uh, for about six years. And then my husband and I moved to California where we live now, and we brought one daughter with us. And then uh, we had two more daughters pretty quickly after that. And the reason why I bring that up is because that affected my nervous system. Uh, my daughters now are 17, 19, and 21. But the reason why I bring that up is my middle daughter is the reason why I got into this work. So Shelly talked about that she started yoga um, first. I did yoga in occupational therapy school, actually, and got the best grades um, that year and, and further. And then I also did yoga through the births of my daughters, but never considered being a yoga teacher. And what happened was my daughter that um, my middle daughter really, um, we didn't realize it, but when, as time went on, when she was about three or four, we realized she was a sensory kid which means, and you may actually have some of these things, um, the tags in her clothes bothered her. Uh, sound, uh, she was highly sensitive to sound. Um, and her nervous system was overloaded. And I knew that we really, I didn't know, here I was an occupational therapist, but I did not know how to help her. And I really felt like I needed to search for that. So I went to the island, um, we went on vacation and we took the, um, I, I told my husband, I wanted to take three mornings of our vacation on the island of Kauai. This was 14 years ago. Um, and I was gonna see all the healers on the island. One person I met with was an Ayurvedic practitioner. And she said, have you ever considered being a yoga teacher? Well, as luck would have it, um, I had not, but I followed that lead. And I feel like all of this becomes a journey. You keep doing more and more to keep learning. And my journey led me back to our hometown. And literally a week later, an Iyengar teacher training was starting. And as I sat in that, pro that um, training, I realized this is therapy. This is what I've been doing all along. I also, um, right after that, um, I started teaching uh, yoga classes for adults, but I also got my yoga kids training and started to work with uh, families and kids using occupational therapy and yoga. And then um, as time went on, I started to realize that my clients were really searching um, for the connection between the mind, body, spirit, and more and more trauma was being released or stress and anxiety as I would treat my patients, especially with shoulder injuries or neck injuries. People were holding those, the muscles so tight around their neck and their shoulder. And when we finally were able to release it with breath and with relaxation and with movement, um, they would cry. 
and let out that trauma. So I further went on to get uh, two extended week-long trainings through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, and it's based out of Washington, D.C., but I uh, was fortunate enough that the program was brought out to California, so I got to do that here. And then the final thing that I've added to my practice is that in the last um, year during the pandemic, I added Ayurvedic medicine uh, wellness counselor training. The reason for that is as an occupational therapist, we look at um, activities of daily living. And one of the th goals that I felt like I was missing as an um, integrative therapist was looking at lifestyle for bowel and bladder and food and herbs and from the very beginning of the day to the end of the person's day for treatment. So I'm gonna go through this with you now. I see adults and kids um, and families in particular using um, Ayurvedic medicine, um, yoga therapy and meditation. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now and we will go through. Okay, so, um, Excuse me, I'm just going to move this up a little bit. So here uh, is another part of beauty and nature. And I walk my dog every day um, for about a three mile walk. I call it a walking meditation. But this is the be a beautiful picture of the Redwoods, um, very close to Mendocino, where uh, I talked of earlier. And um, if you see the light coming in, um, I'd like for us to put ourselves there and do a, an active practice before I go forward. And we've been sitting a long time. And so this is some seated yoga. What I'd like you to do is raise your right arm up and over your head and pretend that we're in this beautiful redwood forest. Take a deep breath in and reach that right fingertips all the way up to the sky and look at your fingertips and think about sun pouring into your heart as you reach and take a deep breath in. You're... Think about bringing in this forest and exhale, bring that arm up and over. Take another deep breath in and really reach through your rib cage. Think about that warm sun coming through the leaves of the trees and exhale, release your fingertips. And then slowly come back to center. Now close your eyes for a minute and feel the difference in the two sides of your body. I don't know about you, but one side of my, my body is heavier and the side, my right side is much lighter. That's where we know that um, you can open your eyes now. Um, that's where we know that br the brain just changed. And I love to show my clients this because they crave to have that balance in both sides of the body. And your body might be craving that right now. So let's go on and do that. So reach the left arm way up to the sky. Once again, think about being in this beautiful redwood forest. Redwood trees um, rely on each other. So think about the roots of these trees underneath you and supporting you. Take a deep breath in and then exhale, bring that left arm up and over next to your ear. Look at your fingertips and take another deep breath in. Think about that warm sun pouring into your heart and then exhale and come back to center. Let's do a twist. So that's also a seated yoga that you can teach your clients or you can do it when you're studying. Um, many of you guys are studying so massively right now for OT and P either whether you're in OT or PT school or you wanna apply or anybody in healthcare that's studying and looking at their computer. So let's do a twist. Um, come to the edge of your seat and bring your right arm in front of you. Take a deep breath and roll that shoulder in and back and exhale, bring that arm on the outside of your left thigh. Deep breath and lift your chin from your chest. And then exhale, look over at your shoulder. One more time, deep breath and lift your chin from your chest. And exhale, look a little further with just your eyes. And then come back to center. Once again, close your eyes and feel the difference in the two sides of your body. It's very different. And that's our brain is giving us this feedback that we've changed our nervous system. Let's open up our eyes again and bring that left arm in front of us, roll that shoulder in and back, take a deep breath in. And uh, as you exhale, bring that arm on the outside of the right thigh. Deep breath and lift your chin from your chest, roll your shoulders in and back and exhale, look over your shoulder. And then one more time, deep breath in and exhale, look a little further with just your eyes and come back to center. So hopefully that opened up um, and gave you a little more energy, like I mentioned with Tigger um, before. So I want to define integrative health. So the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health 
um, which is through NIH. And that um, I've given you that link at the bottom here. Um, it's defined as integrative health begins uh, brings conventional and complementary approaches together in a coordinated way with emphasis on treating the whole person rather than an organ system. And that's what integrative health is really looking at. And that includes um, the, the following things. And you can, um, the list that I'm gonna um, go over right now, you can actually go to the website. And if you're interested, you can uh, get newsletters from them on each of these topics. And it, they're free and it really is amazing to remind us to be able to use this work. So yoga, Tai Chi and Qigong. Um, are part of this work, chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation, meditation, massage, special diets, including Ayurveda, progressive relaxation, and guided imagery. And I'm going to talk about each of these um, a little bit at a time. So what I started realizing when I started treating patients using yoga therapy is that um, the, we instantly felt that brain change, like you just felt when we did that twist and that side opener. Teaching clients to release their stress and trauma and anxiety through yoga and movement and breath then in turn allows them to release that um, trauma from their body, but also changes their nervous system. And I like to give an example. Um, if you think about it, the fight or flight response is where, you know, a tiger is running through the tundra to um, get its prey. Um, what we know in science now uh, through research is that if our body stays in that stress mode and stress and anxiety all the time and stays with adrenaline constantly being released from our body and cortisol, um, we are um, in a free state and um, that is not good for releasing um, trauma. Um, what we need to do is change from that free state um, to a relaxation state and that allows the body to change from that fight or flight to a relaxation response. We still need stress to be able to get through our day sometimes to get an assignment completed, but we can't stay in that state. And that's what we've really started to realize through maybe guided imagery, like I just took you through, like being in the middle of the, the woods and really thinking about being there, even though you're not physically there. That meditation of seated or walking studies are really showing now that um, we're using MRIs to look at yoga and how it changes the brain. And you can look online to see that. We are also seeing how we use MRIs to see how meditation is changing the brain. And it is unbelievable. In 20 days of doing a 20 minute meditation, we can completely change the brain and the way our face looks. So you can look online and see how people literally change the way they look just because they meditate 20 minutes a day. Um, and I like to do um, walking meditation as well as seated. Um, I just think even being in nature, um, we realize that now that there are chemicals, neurotransmitters that are released in nature to be able to heal our nervous system. And I just wanted to offer the Center for Mind Body Medicine um, website because that's where I worked on with trauma. And I'd encourage you to look at that website if you yourself, especially after this year, with stress and anxiety, there's so many um, links to be able to help you and your clients, um, your future clients with our nervous system and stress. What I believe is helping our clients to understand what they need in the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. Um, you're gonna see two pictures here of restorative yoga poses one with an adult and one with a child. Um, what is most important to me is uh, that uh, in a restorative pose, we don't move, we just breathe and we use props to support our body. The adult that you see up top um, also has a support of the eyes. And I don't know if any of you have ever used an eye pillow before, but we've studies are showing that if you put a one pound weight on your eyes, like this eye pill, this has beans in it. It can have rice. It can have flaxseed. It instantly brings on the relaxation response and actually has a connection with the vagus nerve, which is a scientific piece of all this. And that um, that's the, um, the second longest nerve in the body. And it brings relaxation, not only to our heart and to our rib cage and to our lungs, but most importantly, the gut. So if you have gut issues, with bowel and bladder and those issues that really bring it on the relaxation response is something to really consider. And I just use this on my eyes before I go to bed at night and work on some diaphragmatic breathing. And that's what you can see here with support. Um, let's just do that. So just um, take a deep breath in, fill your belly with breath and then exhale and guide your belly button in towards your spine. 
One way that I also do it is something called take five. And I have taught, teach the client, my clients, they're the parents of kids I work with, as well as I do it in um, everywhere I work um, is I take five before I see my clients and I take it breath read with them. And after I leave to get rid of their energy. So I don't carry that in my body. So put your hand up like this um, with a fist and then take a deep breath in and bring each finger up. And then exhale, bring each finger down. And it's really important that um, in the families and with your roommates that they might sense that you are stressed. But if you can teach them, to, all of you to breathe together, just to take five, um, it can really change um, how you think and the way you um, work. So helping my clients find rituals morning and night are really important to me. Uh, and uh, I'll speak a little further about that in just a minute. And then I call it the three H's. Before I get up in the morning um, and before I reach for my phone, I give myself uh, self-care by giving myself a deep breath in for a count of three and breathing out for a count of six. When we elongate the, and double the exhalation, we bring on the relaxation response. And then I say to myself, may I be happy, healthy, and helpful. So um, let's take a deep breath in and think to yourself, may I be happy? And exhale. Take a deep breath in and think about, I may I be um, help, healthy? And take a deep breath in and exhale. And may I be helpful? Take a deep breath in and exhale. So this work that you are doing as an OT or PT, you are being helpful. And then the final picture down here is a child who is in child's pose in a restorative yoga pose. And I call that turtle for kids. So they breathe in their turtle back and the stuffed animal on their back, they give the stuffed animal a ride and it allows them to get some um, re restoration that way and takes their eyes out of the equation, which is really helpful for kids. So with integrative um, OT, before using these techniques, I had no tools in my toolkit, in particular for patients with chronic pain and trauma. Now I love working with people with trauma and chronic pain because I now can show them that we with breath and movement can get out of what's troubling and what feels chronic to them by changing the way we live and move throughout the day. Now I draw my OT roots. And once again, you see these beautiful redwood trees. Um, and then I combine integrative techniques and we heal together. I breathe with my clients. It changes everything. When I used to rehab a shoulder before I learned integrative medicine, it, I did not breathe. I just let, worked with my client with range of motion and didn't breathe with them. It's huge when you do that. We move together. I do the yoga poses, the same thing I'm doing with my client. We do it together. And then that gives us both self-care. And we teach our brain to change around that throughout the day. Now, the other thing that I um, added was uh, the Ayurvedic medicine. And I mentioned um, a little bit that I saw an Ayurvedic practitioner um, to get guidance about where I wanted to go with my daughter. So um, Ayurveda is a sister science with yoga. It comes um, the Indian um, culture and it's a Sanskrit use, uh, we use the Sanskrit language and it means the wisdom of life, not life or the knowledge of longevity. We look at diet modifications, um, lifestyle adjustments, herbal supplements, and cleansing processes. And that could take a whole other course, which I actually teach on Ayurvedic medicine. But what it, we, we look at is every one of us has a, a body consistency or a constitution. Usually it's a mixture of two, um, pitta, kapha, and vata are the body constitutions. Pitta is fire, kapha is earth, and vata is air. And everything from our bowel and bladder, the food we eat, and the movement and types of yoga classes we should take are embodied in knowing what our constitution is. So when my clients come to me, I actually offer them an entire evaluation of looking at what their body type is and give them a plan for everything from bowel and bladder all the way through their lifestyle through the day. If you're interested in knowing what your body constitution is, you can go to banyanbotanicals.com. And it further will give you some of this information. It's free and um, I send it to my clients. And then finally, whoops, um, just the last side that I have to share because it's about, I'm about out of time, is that I want to talk more about my wish for the future in healthcare. My wish for the future is that we understand that we help each other to heal. Um, we help our clients to heal 
and we heal at the same time. Um, this picture that you see here of the hummingbird, I don't know if you know much about hummingbirds, but they, get, they move very, very fast. What's amazing is they also sleep. And it takes a hummingbird from 20 minutes to an hour to rejuvenate after they've slept. We all need to take that in. Sleep and rest, restorative yoga and breathing can give us that energy that we need to do our work, but also relieve stress and anxiety. Um, let's take five one more time, um, and then I will be uh, done with my part of the presentation. So take a deep breath in and breathe out. And may we all uh, say the three H's every day. Know how special you are in looking at going into occupational and physical therapy. It's changed my life, as well as integrative medicine has changed my life. Knowing Shelly has changed my life. And um, may you be healthy, may you be happy, and may you be helpful. So I will stop my share. Perfect. Okay, that's great. So um, just, we need to, we have time for a few questions. So right here, but I just wanted to share this um, here. This will be, this is being recorded. Um, whoops, sorry here, everybody. Let me just get this resource slide up. So I won't spend too much time on this, but I just wanted, Betsy and I wanted to have this up there for, so when you watch the replay, you can have this and pause. So these are the two books um, that we highly recommend, The Yoga and Science in Pain Care, Treating the Person in Pain, uh, Disclosure. That was one that I had co-edited and co-authored. And then this textbook on integrative rehab practice. And um, Betsy and I have contributed to uh, the textbook. And this one is edited, as you see, by Matt Ar and Arlene Schmidt. And then I wanted just to leave this on here. We're not gonna go through it all. We wanna take questions, but um, like I said, when you watch the replay, here's a whole bunch of great resources to learn more. The left side is all some really great books on these topics and the right side are some really great papers as well as some websites. So thank you all. And again, you can look at this um, later and see how you can contact Betsy and I through our websites and through social media. So let's get a couple questions in. Awesome, thank you two so much. I loved hearing about that. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I personally love yoga. Um, a question I have for you guys is, are we seeing more holistic approaches being included in all aspects of medicine? Maybe just not uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy? We're both nodding our heads, yes. Um, Go ahead, Shelly. Yeah, so I'll say to that one, I'll say yes. And um, actually, I do have this. It will only take a second, but I think it's kind of neat to show you all this. I think people will be interested in it. So I thought this was really interesting in, you know, where we can see some of these integrative type practices in hospitals and um, community-based clinics and physician practices. And this other section are things like pain management centers, HIV clinics, eating disorder clinics. Um, and then there's also another, this is a survey with Maryland University of Integrative Health and the International Association of Yoga Therapists. They did this survey in 2015, um, but asking, you know, the different, different yoga therapists where they work in medical settings and different departments. And you can see on the screen here, cardiology and oncology, pediatrics, orthopedics, of course, the physical therapy and rehab, but also surgery and psychiatry. And the other department is uh, things like neurology, primary care, internal medicine, women's health and pain clinics. So um, I always have a bunch of extra slides there just for those things. But uh, my answer is yes. I don't know, Betsy, if you have anything to add, like more, you know, I do know that there are dentists, um, pharmacists that have come to my training programs. Um, I've also had orthopedic surgeons come to my programs to learn more how to integrate these practices in philosophy. Um, and physicians, of course, we have a lot of medical doctors that are integrative that are within our group. Betsy, do you have anything to add? Well, and just the, when I got my training, uh, the two different weeks trainings through the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, many of them were physicians. 
and nurses, um, but I was really impressed that they were coming out of med school um, and they wanted to know about trauma. And so that's what's exciting. Um, whether you're a psychiatrist or a doctor or a nurse, um, more and more of us are realizing that we need this work to not only heal our clients, um, help them, but for ourselves. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Uh, this, we're coming to an end for our session. Um, thank you again for your topic. And it was really interesting. I really enjoyed listening to it. Um, next uh, on our roster, we have an overview of dentistry and healthcare in five minutes. So please stay tuned for that. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.